Let's all stand and turn to 254. Romans chapter 1, uh, got a couple of verses there for opening this morning, and um, with uh, Monday being a holiday to the world, uh, I thought there's a, it's also a significant day in uh, Christian history, so I'd like to wish everybody a happy Reformation Day. <laughs> Anyway, here in Romans chapter 1, some famous verses, but starting with 14, Paul says, I'm a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. So as much as in, in me is, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. And so those words right there are uh, famous words in the life of a man named Martin Luther. Uh, he was a reformer from back then. And uh, from what I understand of his story, after living under the oppression of Roman religion, he uh, came to this understanding that the just shall live by faith. This is a quotation from Habakkuk 2.4, and it's quoted three times in the New Testament here in Romans, in Galatians 3.11, and in Hebrews uh, 10. But um, Luther, though, what I love about his story I wanted to mention this morning was he cast himself totally on the Lord. He, uh, there were some things that they were dealing with back then with oppression of religion and uh, selling of indulgences and all the, the, the lunacy that had got mixed in. But Luther wanted to uh, go back to the purity of the gospel, just the gospel of Christ, and uh, so he came to that understanding that the just shall live by faith. And it's to the Jew first and also to the Greek, to everyone. It wasn't just for the ones who was first delivered to, even though that's revealed in Genesis 15, 6 and confirmed in Hebrews 10. But it's also to the Greek. We see that in Galatians chapter 3, verse 11. But it's for all men, 
that the gospel of Christ, the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. So we're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Don't need man's religion, just a pure, simple gospel. The title of our lesson is Study God's Word. And the point of our lesson today is when we regularly study God's Word, it will keep us firmly grounded. Now, have you, ever, have you ever played the game um, where you tell someone, you whisper to someone something, and then they tell another person, and they tell another person, and it goes all around the room? The last person then tells what they hear. Well, what if I tell Don uh, something about my tractor? I tell him it's blue, it's got 75 horsepower, and what I really like about it is the economy mode on it. You know, if I bush hog or spray, I use the economy mode. For the bush hog and sprayer to work properly, it needs to run 540 RPMs at the, on the, at the PTO. I run my tractor just over 1,500 RPMs on the economy mode to have 540 RPMs at the PTO. If I used the standard mode, I would have to run it around 1,800 to 2,200 RPMs. So it saves me money on fuel while other tractors may not have this uh, capability. Pretty good story. Now, if I tell Don that, and he tells Mom, Mom tells, I mean, it just starts going around the room. Can you imagine what Sandy will say what I just said? But if I gave each one of you a paper of what I just said, and you studied it, each one of you studied it, and then you told someone what I said, then the story would be a whole lot closer of being right. The same is true with God's Word. Now, some people, though, will take a verse out of God's Word and make it say whatever they want it to say for their own benefit. You know, I can take any book and read a paragraph in it and make that book say anything I want it to say. You know, another reason we need to study God's Word is that, you know, language. Language changed over the years. Just, I mean, just look at how much language has changed during, during our lifetime. Now, if we went back in time, say we went back 50 years, and you tell that person that your cell phone is Roman, that person would look at you like you're crazy. What in the world are you talking about? You know, another reason we need to study God's Word is there's because there are so many false teachers out in the world today. So many people that misinterpret interpret God's Word. You know, we sometimes, we do, we need to read another verse, or even sometimes we even need to read another verse in another book of the Bible to know what that one verse really means. To know God's Word, it requires us to study it. And I believe, I truly believe God intended it to be that way. Because the more we study, the more grounded we'll be in God. You know, our lesson is taken from 2 Timothy, and, and Paul writes this to Timothy to encourage him to stand strong against false teachings and to study and teach God's Word. We'll get started reading here in verse 14. Of these things... Put them in remembrance, charging them before the Lord that they strive not about words to no profit, but to the subverting of the hearers. Paul knew the most effective way for, for, Timothy, for Timothy's uh, congregation, for, well, was for, for Timothy to faithfully study 
and to teach God's Word. Also, he, he, he studied God's Word so he could recognize false teachings and to be able to reject them. You know, Timothy, he was warned. He was to warn his congregation to, that they strive not about words. This is meaning that they were not to argue over meaningless religious words or, or ideals. You know, this, this must have been a problem back then because Paul, he had mentioned it also, the same problem back in 1 Timothy. <clears throat> you know, one, one of the past times back then was that the group of men, they would gather together and they, they would debate the meaning of ideals, especially religious beliefs. Paul says there's no profit in that. Arguing over what a word means could just go on and on. To defeat someone in a debate like this, Paul says, what does it profit? You're sure not growing to be more Christ-like. Also, arguing, it can cause harm. It can cause harm to others. You know, a non-believer will not gain any more knowledge hearing someone argue. A new believer, they can, they can become confused over the correct interpretation. So arguing, there's no benefit. In verse 15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly divided the word of truth. So Paul tells Timothy to stay faithful and not to be ashamed of his role of being a pastor. He needed to study and show himself approved by God. You know, being rightly divided means cutting straight. We should cut straight to the word of truth. And the only way we can do this is by studying God's Word. We need to, we need to be able to tell the truth accurate. You know, failing, failing to, to, to do so will lead to divided judgment, which is where argument, arguments may start. In verse 16, But shun the profane and vain babblings, for they will increase more into more ungodliness. So Paul tells Timothy to teach the truth about the gospel and to make it clear where people would understand. But then tell, uh, he tells uh, Timothy to shun profane and vain babblings. You know, no matter how clear we can present the gospel, there's going to be some in the world they're still going to reject the gospel. And they'll play on words to try to make their point. We should not argue with these people like this. We're just to tell the truth and move on. Evil, evil loves to argue and cause chaos and try to make us less Christ-like when it comes down to, when we come down to their level and argue with them. Just tell them the truth. Tell them the truth and let Christ do the rest. In verse 17, And their word will eat as doth a canker, of whom Hymenaeus and Philetus, something like that. Here, these two men that Paul mentions, they were false teachers. They taught. They taught that the resurrection of believers, it had already happened. They were trying to lead people away from the truth of the gospel. Paul tells Timothy to shun them. Don't even recognize they even exist. It's kind of like today where people do awful crimes such as a, a school shooting you know, what these people love to see, they love to see their name and their picture on, the, on TV all across the country. Now, if the news media gave them no recognition, just like it had never happened, you know, school shootings would probably go down. Paul is saying that if you recognize these false teachers, 
it could cause a rapid growth like a canker. A canker is the death of body tissue. It's kind of like a, a gangrene, which can spread quickly and cause death. The Greeks, the Greeks, they loved to argue and debate new concepts. But all this do would cause harm and spread, and spread false ideals. So Paul tells Timothy to shun these false teachers. In verse 18, who concerning the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. So Paul addresses one of the false teachers' teachings was the resurrection of believers had already passed. You know, what they may have misunderstood was that when a person was saved, they were raised in Christ in baptism. Whatever the reason was, was Paul says it is a false teaching. Another false teaching back then was material things in the human body, they were all evil. So they taught, since the human body was evil, there was no way Jesus was in the flesh. He had to be spirit. Another false teaching was that if the human body was, was evil, then it really doesn't matter how we live our life down here. You know, this type of thought process let people sin and do whatever they wanted to do and ignore God. You know, there's been all kinds of false teachings over the years. Paul tells Timothy and us, to stand strong on the foundation of God, which is also in our next verse, in verse 19. Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth that, that are his, and let everyone that name, nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. You know, with all the evil that is going on all around us in the world back then and, what, and actually I think we're seeing it a lot worse today. Paul says, nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure. You know, one day Jesus, he's going to destroy all this evil that's going on in this world. Paul says that, that we that have accepted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we are sealed, meaning we're secured by God. Paul says the Lord knoweth them that are His. You know, we, have, we can have an intimate relationship with God. And because of our relationship with God, this is what should motivate us. I mean, it should motivate us to depart from any iniquity. We prove that we're his children by remaining faithful to him and his word. Verses 22 and 23, Flee also youthful lust, but follow righteousness, faith, charity, peace, and them that call on the Lord out of out of a pure heart. But foolish and unlearned questions avoid, knowing that they do gender strifes. You know, Paul had been warning Timothy to avoid this sinful behavior of these false teachers and what they were teaching. So Paul then begins encouraging Timothy to set a positive example of his own life. To others and to share uh, the, the truth of God's word. You know, Paul starts, though, in, in this verse, two things for Timothy to avoid. He tells him to flee also youthful lust. Now, Paul doesn't say what, what kind of youthful lust, but, you know, I got to think, you know, most of us, I know I can, can think back in, in our teenage years and remember things that we did that we shouldn't have done. Paul is saying that we should flee and abandon 
abandon our sinful nature. Next, Paul says, foolish and unlearned questions avoid. Now, now Paul is not saying for us to avoid a non-Christian if they asked us what we may, what we may, or asked us a question and we think, man, you know, that is a stupid question. We're not to avoid that. They, you know, they may be searching for the truth. And we need to be able to tell them the truth about the gospel. But there is, there's going to be some people who is not interested in knowing the truth. All they want to do is to argue and debate useless words. Paul tells Timothy, don't waste your time with these people because all it's going to do is cause harm. But then there are four things that Paul lists that we're to run toward to be a useful vessel for God. First is righteousness. In this verse, uh, Paul is not meaning righteousness that Jesus provides to us so that we can, we can have access to God. Instead, it's about our lifestyle. You know, given to God and also given to others. Second was faith. This also is not talking about our faith that leads us to Christ. Instead, instead it's about our faithfulness to God because of our, our relationship with God through Jesus. Third is charity. Charity in this verse means agape. It's a love, a love we, that we can only have only, that only comes through our relationship with God, through our faith in Jesus, and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Fourth is peace. We can only have true peace by having a close relationship with Jesus. Now, if we focus, if we focus on what's going around in the world today, we will never have peace. If we think peace will come if the Republicans will win this election, if they do, I have hope that things are going to get better and maybe stop some of this foolishness and the evil that's going on right now in our country. But if anybody thinks they won't have peace after the election, they're going to be disappointed. Something else is going to happen. Something else is going to come up. The only true peace that we can have is achieved through Jesus. That's it. In verse 24, And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. Paul reminds Timothy that, that he was a servant of the Lord. Now he and us, we're not to get into arguments. We're not to get angry with someone else that may have a different belief than what we have. Paul says that we're to be gentle unto all men, and we're also we're to be patient. Thing is, if you think about it, <clears throat> Jesus, he never forced anyone to believe in him. Still doesn't today. Verse 25, in meekness instructing those that oppose themselves, if God Preadventure will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. <clears throat> Paul stresses again that, that Timothy, he was to reach out to those who might oppose our belief in Jesus. He said, instructing those that oppose themselves. We're to teach and we're to instruct with meekness. When we do this, then our character is the work of, a, of the servant of the Lord. So what is our pastor's goal? What is uh, any child of God's goal? It's not to argue and to win arguments. Paul says our goal is to lead the lost 
to repentance. Lead them to the knowledge of the truth, which is life-changing. Lead them to Jesus, God's amazing grace. Most important, most important thing anyone will ever do in their life is accepting God's free gift of salvation. Our last verse here, 26, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. You know, a lot of people, a lot of people is so embedded in sin they don't even realize they are a slave to sin. They don't have a clue. When we witness to that person, Paul says it will enable them to recover themselves. What will happen is they'll experience God's truth and they begin to realize that they have been a slave to sin. Or another way we can say it They've been a slave to the Satan. Paul is saying that it's so, so important for us to study. Study God's Word and and then share it. Share it with others, what we have learned. Let God work through us for His honor and for His glory. That's what we should do.